to this week's episode. Today, I'm actually really excited. I'm talking to Elizabeth Gould. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Happy to and be here. It's, uh, you're a mother and an educator, and you've recently written a book about uh, female archetypes. And it's, it was really fascinating. To, so I've got heaps of questions and I've, I've got to tell everybody that I just said to Elizabeth, I, we literally just hopped on and I said, oh, do you know what? I'm going to press record because I know we're going to be chatting and I'm going to really regret not actually starting the episode. So welcome. Let's get the formal bit over with. <laughs> Thank you. So tell me about, because I've kind of heard about archetypes you know, in terms of your personality or whatever archetypes. But talk to me first about archetypes and then about feminine archetypes and what you do and what why it's important and all those kind of things. I've got so many questions. <laughs> I've just put about a gazillion questions into that sentence. Apologies. <laughs> all right. Well, an archetype in general is like a form, a template of something. So if I put it in terms of like the bad boy, the rebel, you you know, you can, everybody knows somebody that, the lover, we all know somebody who fits into that category, the the mother, that there's these kind of universal themes and symbols that we can, it helps us relate to other humans that way by kind of getting a sense of who they are. And so feminine archetypes are a spectrum of different aspects that we have in our feminine nature. And we can often see this most clearly in goddess archetypes, or if you read your Greek and Roman myths, that there's, you know, they all have different personalities or qualities or things that make them who they are. And as humans, we can, I can relate or resonate with different aspects that I see out there, but that are actually in me. Okay, how did you get interested in this? Because you've actually got a degree in art history, haven't you? I do. Um, Well, as a kid, my favorite part of school was the mythology when we learned about ancient myths. And that just kind of fired my imagination to think of these images of, you know, gods and goddesses that had very real human qualities. um, And then these incredible stories about them that um, you learn about. And art history, for me, studying that in college was like a continuation. It's a, a, art is a kind of visual storytelling. So you see a lot of symbols painted in the art or uh, different visual clues that tell that tell stories. And so I love that. And, um, and, and throughout my life, I have um, study, you know, read books like um, Women Who Run With the Wolves or Goddess and Every Woman by um, Jean Shinoda Bolin. And they're just books that kind of help bolster up uh, what a woman can be because sometimes in our society, we don't get to see the full range and we don't get to honor and re- revere the full range of who we are. That's really interesting, like in, in what's happening now. And it's it's not just in women, it's in men as well. You know, we Absolutely. have roles that we are boxed into and it's very difficult, particularly if we're going through a hard time. If we're going through a difficult time, it's really, we don't feel that we have many options, do we? That's right. That's right. And that's part of why um, I felt compelled to write the book, The Well of Truth, because the character throughout the story is constantly meeting um, a crossroads or a challenge and she doesn't really know how to move forward and and then she'll meet uh, a mythic character or uh, a goddess that will kind of help her steer her way through something difficult like childbirth or going to see a divorce attorney or uh, sitting at the deathbed of a loved one. These different things that we have to kind of dig deep to find ourselves in that. So it's it's almost like we can use these archetypes as a guide to, so kind of as a guide to how to behave, but also as a reflection on what we're capable of. Exactly. That's it. They're both. And yeah, it's, we all need to be reminded of what we're capable of in a really good way. 
We do, don't we? Because we like those limitations that we have. Talk to me about because I'm I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go off on my own little rant here. No Talk, problem. You just do it. <laughs> Talk to me about how those archetypes can help because if we, like you were saying in the book, you used this particular character, and as she went through her life, these different archetypes appear. Yes. Explain that concept to me and how we can all use it. All right. Let's see. I'll give an example. So in one of the stories. The main character, whose name is Grace, is going, she's going through a divorce, but she's having a hard time letting go of everything that she has embedded in that relationship. And she's met by Kali, the Hindu goddess of creation, preservation, destruction, who helps her burn things down so that she has more space to keep living. Because I think that's, that's really the idea of our lives is that change is constant and we have to keep moving forward with whatever ingredients we have to play with. And so the archetypes can help us engage with different qualities or different aspects of of like, if I need support, I'm going to call on Thena, like she's tough. I'm going to call on Kali if I want something to be sensual and beautiful and lush. Well, got to have Aphrodite there, you know? So so (laughs) we're just calling forth all of these different... um, aspects of our experience as a human being because it's almost like using the the archetypes is almost like condensing a personal development session into one person okay this person this right now represents this and this is probably what's going to be most useful in your life right now it's kind of like that isn't it condensing a whole book into yes just putting it all t- together in that way. And um, I'm, I'm curious for you, when you are in a moment of breakthrough in your life, what sustains you or what helps you get from one side of the fence to the other? It's actually really interesting you saying that because as I'm thinking about it, I work best, as we all probably do as human beings, when I have a plan B, <laughs> when I know what I'm going to do. because. When you're confronted with something unexpected, we don't necessarily know how to act. And then we come out of that experience and go, oh, my God, I can't believe I said that. I should have said blah. You know, those conversations we have with ourselves at 3 a.m. And as I'm listening to you talking, it's kind of like the archetypes give us that plan B. Okay, if I know this archetype, I have a way of being and a way of behaving, a, a set of of actions that I can take if this happens. And that was kind of what I got out. It's like, oh my goodness. Yeah. And and I'm only kind of coalescing this idea as we're talking now. Yes, it gives us that plan B. It makes it a lot easier. Yes. Uh, and and the truth of it is that the archetype is a, or the or sort of that picturing of an archetype, it's sort of like an intermediate step because all of those things are inside you anyways. And, and so that's just sort of like you're um, into the person that's in between. That they can help you get there. But you you are that. It's just a matter of granting yourself permission. Like, I am the ferocious one today. And and being okay with that. You know what I mean? That it's, um, I, I think that, you know, we live in like a very narrow range of expression. And certainly the archetypes show us and help us just live live bigger in our emotional life that's really interesting because something else has just occurred to me because we go oh well that's not who I am we all do that how does this help with that because if if like I don't particularly see myself as let's say a lush sexy goddess I do that is not in my realm of (laughs) reality for myself (laughs) well there's many ways we could take this conversation but um, there are social constructs that may overlay some range of expression, like perhaps um, religious upbringing may affect how one feels about being sensual or, or owning one's sexuality. So, so there's like some things that are social constructs, and then there are just some things that's like, I'm just not into that, or I'm... Um, you know, that's a stretch for me that's not interesting. So so everyone's different and you have, you know, we each have our own 
a unique way of being in the world. Uh, but I think it's all about feeling totally aligned and engaged with whatever feels right to you and, and, and being as authentic as you can be. We're not all the same. And so that's what I would, I would say about that. Yeah, the other place I was going with that is that statement that we make to ourselves, that's not who I am is in itself really restricting because it doesn't allow us to play or explore anything. Right. There's a saying in, in Hindu that's uh, it's either I am that and that and that and that or else it's I am not that or that or that or that. So you can, you can either bring it all on or push it all off. And, and it's kind of the same effect at the end of the day. You, you kind of, I think, come back around to, you know, it's just a great big mystery we're in the middle of and I'm not really sure what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause what would it, cause what would it be like? Have you explored all these archetypes for yourself? I have. And um, in fact, when I wrote the book, I started them, you know, each chapter is something that I could relate to. Like I just sort of set the stage and then I didn't know which archetype wanted to show up and what they wanted to say. So there was kind of like, okay, here's the, here's the stage. And sometimes it took a while for someone to show up and be like, yeah, this door is going this way. I'm like, okay, sure. I'm not going to complain. So they definitely, they wrote the book with me. Yeah. Or they wrote the book. I just kind of scribed it down. That's really interesting. So how many archetypes do you know of? How many are in the book? And then how many more didn't appear in the book? Oh, my gosh. That's a Well, well, they, you know, they say the, 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 the goddess of a thousand names. So there, there's at least a thousand names for her. Um, there are 24 the different ones that appear in the book. And they're not all women. The green man makes an appearance and a wolf makes an appearance. So, so um, it's predominantly feminine archetypes because I'm a woman and that's kind of what appeals to me right now is sensibilities that are similar to my own. But um, I think that there's probably an endless array of archetypes, like one for every grain of sand on the beach. Sorry, I've just got to apologise to anybody watching this. My eyes are running. And so if you see me wiping my face, that's why I'm not crying. There is nothing wrong. <laughs> well, I've got, I'm assuming it's hay fever, but we'll see. So archetypes come mainly from older societies. Is that right? Because we don't really have, do we have archetypes in our modern society? Absolutely. So you could think of, let's see, Kim Kardashian. Okay. You could think of Taika Waititi. Oh, he's a, he's a good one. I like Taika yeah. Waititi. <laughs> you you could think of Marlon Brando. You could think, you know, that, that that in fact, celebrities are really good at being kind of our archetypal figures because they represent something that we can all relate to, and they're on they're larger than life. You know, they're on screen. They're having these extraordinary experiences through the films or shows that they're on that you know we look at them as being kind of well they're stars so they're a little bit off planet <laughs> I hadn't yeah I never thought of it in that way but it's right isn't it we when we look like there's um one of the things you can do in personal development or whatever is have a, a round table of people who you want as your mentors you know an imaginary round table of people who you'd like and it's interesting that while some of them for me were actual real historical figures other of others of them were characters from books or films yeah and those too are can be archetypes so do you find that you gravitate towards like a certain type of character or? <laughs> so the classic one that I went, oh, my goodness, was Janeway from Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> hey. That was like really strong leader, female character, but she was she was feminine as well. 
but strong yeah. with it. No, so yeah. Fabulous. I mean, that, and that's and 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 that says a lot about you know the things that that you hold in yourself and that that you share. And so she's she's like um yeah a mentor or an archetype of that too. Which maybe in the in the ancient days would have had in ancient Greece that would have been called um, Artemis or Athena or you know. So they're just they're all the same things, but just with different names over time. That, That's yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. It, it's it's kind of like, uh, so are there archetypes that rec- recognise, archetypes that represent the same kind of personality or I can't think of the right word, the, the same kind of attributes over lots of different cultures down oh, the ages? Definitely, definitely. I'm just trying to think like, let's say something like Venus, Venus, goddess of love. Every culture has a has a goddess of love. Um, the, from the Nordic, Freya, the you know beautiful goddess of war, um, ancient Celtic queen Maeve. You have um, Aphrodite in Rome, and, and you know so you, know, you have Aphrodite in Greece. I get that confused, but but anyways, all that to say is that that through throughout history, you have. It's the same thing, just reinvented and repackaged, rebranded to whatever appeals to that culture at the time. So I might suggest that Kim Kardashian's is that all things that are considered beautiful in our culture. Would you would you say? I was actually thinking the same thing, yeah, because I was going to ask you what does Kim Kardashian represent, and then as you were talking, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, the hourglass figure, the Marilyn Monroe, the exactly over sexuality kind of thing the beauty and all the rest of it it's all about enhancing the beauty yeah that's right yeah so (laughs) why do we need archetypes because we seem to don't we if they're a common thing down the ages why do we need them Hmm. i'm guessing in a way to help us orient ourselves as we walk through life like it's always good to have a role model or someone that we can model ourselves after. I mean, I think about progressing through life from very much what your podcast is about, from um, you know marriage to being a mother to moving through menopause. It's like I'm always looking around. I always have been like, what are the other young moms doing? Oh, what are the older women doing? You know, trying to like get a sense of how I fit into this um, equation. And I think for, for women, it's very important because uh, we, we often are in our own little, in our own little world, whereas if we talk together about things and share things, then um, somehow we realize we're, we're more similar than we are different. Yeah, because our society in particular, because it's more fragmented because of nuclear families and what have you, And that was one of the things that I wanted to overcome with the podcast is Mm. as we, a lot of us don't know what happens during perimenopause and menopause. And a lot of us perceive menopause as being really a, a negative. There is nothing positive about menopause. And overcoming that kind of experience and belief is one of the things that I want to get out of this, that I wanted people to get out of this podcast. Absolutely. I, I I have to say, I'm so grateful to you that the types of topics that you talk about on your podcast are just like opening up windows for people to imagine like, oh, I'm not the only one who feels this way. And, 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 and I firmly believe that if women in particular can start to wake up to this feeling, the connection that, that there it also makes us stronger in ourselves and able to meet the challenges that that are in the world now that how can we be present in a way that we can lead the way especially the 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 older women we're, we know what we're doing <laughs> right. i was actually thinking of of um, renaming the podcast and i probably won't but uh, because a couple of people have said to me, well, I'm not married and I don't have children, so two of the three things don't apply to me. But it's it's something that as 
we don't value ourselves as we get in older. And that is one of the things that we really need to change that belief because our ex, and you do cover this in the book as well. You talk about this because I was reading it and I'm like, yes, I've done a few podcasts on that and I'm really glad because we haven't necessarily been in the workforce as mothers because we've been looking after kids or we've taken lower paid jobs or whatever. We don't value the experiences that we've had as a parent, as a stay at home parent or somebody who's supporting their partner as they're building their careers or their business. Hmm. And that was one of the key points in your book as well, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, parenting is really hard. <laughs> it's intense. And, and you know, I, I think you, you made a distinguishing point about even if a woman hasn't gotten married or had children, that there's, we still go through these phases. They would, in the ancient times, they would have called it the, the maiden phase as the young woman, the mother phase where you're like organizing people and you're kind of holding space and, and making things happen. And then, and then the crone, and that's the wiser woman who has all of the wisdom and experience who's the big boss, like she, she knows what's going on. And, and so we, we, we have that, even though in our culture, it's all been a little bit eh, mixed up. Um, and, and often women by our age feel invisible. It's like, oh my gosh. Oh yeah, invisible. You do cover that too. Yeah. How do we overcome that feeling of, of invisibility? Because it is a real thing. <laughs> it is a real thing. And I, I think someone said to me the other day, it's like, there's these structures that we've been living in for a very long time. And, uh, and, and we've internalized, we've internalized these thoughts about ourselves. And so we kind of self police. And it's, it's just a matter of like walking outside the structure into the open air and saying, like, if, if I want to make myself known, I just have to do it and, and not, not keep saying to myself, I'm invisible, I'm invisible, I'm invisible. But you have to like make a conscious decision. And often it helps to be with other people and you can you know, fluff up the energy and the the confidence when you're together with friends. And yeah, it's an interesting thing, but I'm thinking like it, we're talking about it. You're, you're mentioning all these things in your podcast and people are listening. These, these changes, these cracks in the, in the structure are happening and women are feeling and men as well, but I, I'm talking specifically about women because that's what I know that, that uh, women are starting to say, Hey, I exist. I have a right to be here and take up space. I have something to say, and uh, I'm I'm worth it. So there's there's all these these new things, and I see the younger generations just wow, really bringing it bringing it home, and um, that's encouraging. It is, isn't it? I think the younger generation, because I've got four kids, and they're probably a similar age to yours. You know, yeah. sort of eighteen to twenty eight, but. I think the younger kids have got their heads screwed on in terms of where things need to go in society. You know, I think we're, we're kind of moving beyond that, well, youth is everything kind of thing, kind of belief. That's my feeling from talking to my kids and their friends. That's all I can say. <laughs> and toes too. But I, I also feel, though, that as a, a postmenopausal woman, like part of my responsibilities if if i want to see change i need to stand up for it and and not just be like oh leave it for the young ones no, no i need to that there's you're never off the hook if you want to be engaged in life you have to stand up and express whatever it is that you feel it's still about being a role model for the younger generation all the time isn't it it is it is e even if it doesn't seem like they want it or that it appeals to them, I think that's always, always going to be there. And so it's, a, it's for me, I feel it's a matter of claiming it. Like, yeah, this is what I am. And, um, and, and also seeking out opportunities to, to be with the younger generation. And, and um, they're, they're holding a lot of things that 
I didn't have to think about when I was their age. And and I don't have the answers, but I can be supportive and encouraging and uh, do what I can to help them achieve what it is that they want to achieve in this life. I think I, I was out with some friends the other night and one of my friends who's, you know, she's postmenopausal as well or certainly early postmenopausal, and she was telling me that they'd, her and a group of friends had been out on, a, a, the big group of friends had been out and the service to, and where they'd been was shocking. And the young manager sent over the even younger wait staff and the waiter, the young waitress, and my friend said she was only about 18, 19, came across and she said, I believe you've got some feedback for me. And my friends just went, not appropriate. <laughs> Don't send that. And it's, in a way, we are women our age, we will just, we're starting to just tell it straight to people. There's no pussyfooting around. There's no, you know, oh, let's be nice to this. We're like, no, I haven't got the time for that. This is how it goes. But also we will take responsibility for things, you know, and, and I think that's moving beyond the invisibility, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's so important. And doesn't it feel good to be like, I don't have any time for any beep beep. I'm, I'm like here, I'm on, I'm ready to go. So um, I, I personally think that being postmenopausal has gotten a really bad reputation. And quite frankly, I'm loving this time in my life. So, so you know, it, it, it's a matter of changing s- structures. So for, for a number of years, I ran um, an organization that was about positive um, menstrual education and awareness and also menopausal awareness. And and it's amazing, like how deeply entrenched these taboos are. And some people just like, eh, I don't want to hear about it. And other people, you know, often younger because they don't have the, they don't have the same kind of inherited distaste or impressions. And so, so you know, they're open to learning about new things. But um, I think I think it's really being chipped away at, and that's. It's so important. It's going to make us feel all the more. It's such a wasted resource to me. I, it doesn't make any logical sense. We've got, de- honest, I'm watching there's a guy across the valley from where I live, right, and he's doing whatever earthworks on his property, and I'm watching him going, you could not organise your way out of the paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Because certain things, we've done them for so long, we could just go, okay, you do this, you do that, you do the other, sort it out and do it in that order. And that's why the Dalai Lama said, it's Western women who are going to save the world. (laughs) Did he really? I did not know that. Yeah, he did say that. And uh, I've heard a lot of people, you, you know, use that as sort of a rallying cry, like, you know, we've, we've got to step up and say what we mean and no more as you said earlier like of the just being nice and pretty and making things good but standing up for what we believe in and and i find that really exciting because you know what there's there's not a lot to lose i mean there is a lot to lose what am i saying it's more like i don't have i don't care i'm just gonna say say what i want to say Um, yeah Is, is there an archetype that goes with that oh gosh Apart from like the crone is the obvious one, but it doesn't have particularly attractive connotations. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, there's like a wise women of all different types. Let me just think, who would who would that be? Let me think about this for a moment while we're talking, and I'm I'm sure she'll tap me on the shoulder and say, you forgot about me. How dare you? Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? But I do think it is so important for us not to take that invisibility thing into our own hands. We're not invisible anymore. There there might be a period that we have to go through of feeling invisible in order to go, okay, that doesn't work for me. (laughs) And and yet the other side of the coin is there's sometimes where invisibility does work for me. So it's kind of a win-win that we get to choose 
how we want. The, the main thing, though, is to choose not to have these limiting thoughts about ourselves. Yeah, not to have the invisibility as the only option. It's like, okay, okay. let me just blend into the background here. That's right. And you know what they say, um, you know, mothers are so inventive. We can be like, okay, today I'm going to go on a stealth mission. I need that invisibility. And another day, nope, I'm going to be right out there in all my glory. So so we have, you know, we're at the a stage of our lives, which is mastery. Mm. You know, we're, we, we, we've experienced so much life. We've seen so many sunrises. We've you know, we've just been through a lot. And, and um, this is kind of like the pinnacle of, of our wisdom years. So let's, let's share that. Let's be that. It's interesting, because one of the big things, like my eldest is 28 now, he's just turned 28. And he's looking at having a family of his own. And he's going, oh, mom, you're, you know, you'll really look forward to being a grandma. And I'm like, no. <laughs> My youngest has only just finished school. I really don't want to do anything like that for a long, long time. Not interested. Because now I have the opportunity to think about what I want to do. Because when you're a, when you're going through all that time up to menopause, it is all about everybody else hormonally. Whether you've got kids or not, hormonally, you're designed to think about other people. But when those hormones stop, you're like, mm, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And, and it, it feels like going through menopause, like rewires, restructures, everything. I mean, it's like the hot flashes are just like clearing things out. And, you know, I felt when I was going through perimenopause, a lot of times I just felt kind of like woozy. Like, I'm not really sure what's happening. You know, there was just sort of this in between like being in a cocoon or something and then and then coming out it's like oh that's it i'm i'm clear so maybe there there's a natural reason why we go through this period of time so that we can come out and fully be ourselves i mean it it actually took me a while to not think about other people because i was so used to it but but then when i did the shift it was super exciting and and fun (laughs) Still is. So so what what for you has been in, in having gone through that transition? Um, how, how do you see you know your life differently or or things that you've explored about yourself? Is it has it felt like a very dramatic shift for you? Oh, it was hugely dramatic because I was going through menopause as my two daughters were going through puberty. <laughs> you know that mother nature's little joke. Oh. Smile in our house sometimes. <laughs> and it, it was that transition because my daughters were teenagers at the time and they were going through all their stuff. There was a, a real pull for me. I didn't want to do the mothering thing anymore. I knew it wasn't right for me, but I had to do it. So there was a real resentment there about the whole thing for a few years. <laughs> Yeah. Poor daughters. I actually have a great relationship with them, but good Lord, it was a bad few years. <laughs> and, and look, you're, you're laughing about it. And I think that's also one of the things that I um, wanted to show through this book is like, sometimes, you know, life is just hard. You just, there's nothing you can do about it. And, and yet, you know, it will pass. Like the hardness will pass. You'll make it through. And, and one day you'll be able to like, hopefully laugh about it or just see it differently and hold it differently or see the gifts. So, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing is to, you feel the intensity and then it, and then it moves. And you know, now you're, you're laughing about those crazy hot years when you were going through menopause and they were going through puberty. It was pretty average. <laughs> <laughs> I know in one of the things, uh, in, in one part of your book, and I can't remember who it is, but some archetype appears and says you can't move forward or you can't have love or anything when your heart's filled with resentment. And I went, oh, my God, yes. <laughs> yes, I have known that resentment. Um, yeah, is it helpful? But it also happens when you – when we give our lives so completely to other people that we don't save 
enough like to feed ourselves that 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 can happen and i just say if it's happening to you it's okay like don't don't get down on yourself for it but see how you can find yourself um, a new a new way of thinking about it instead of just like cuz resentment i find just gets thicker and thicker and and it's, there's no room to move with it it just tethers you down yeah and um, when you're when you're in that resentment, I mean, there's, resentment is a warning sign that you're on the wrong path. That was what it was to me. But I was also very attached to my resentment because I really wanted to be right about this. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to give it up. <laughs> right. Well, that, and, and I think that's also another thing that as going through menopause, it's like you have to fit through the eye of the needle and you can't take anything that's too big, you know, you, you have to kind of streamline it to make it through to the other side. And so you have to decide whether you want to take that or not. And if you don't take it, you'll, you'll find a lot more space to fill up with things that you want to have in your life. (laughs) And they do disappear. It all disappears. All that stuff that goes through our minds and because it's a massive transition in what is important to ourselves in life, isn't it? And and I think there's also a sense of um, like oh, okay like we're not in the beginning of the book we're we're like three quarters of the way through the book God willing and and you know huh if I if there's something that that I have on my bucket list or something that feels important to me to accomplish it's a pretty good time to to do it so there's a, that I feel a sense of urgency yeah sharing and it and it can be you know something big or a little but it's like now is the time now is the time now so your time when it came your time is that when you moved because obviously you're american but you live in new zealand don't you i do and my family moved to new zealand in in 2003 and then we went through um lots of family changes and so i ended up spending several years back in the states and then um, when i was able to move move back to New Zealand and I'm so happy I did I really I love it here and are you are you in New Zealand or are you in Australia I'm in Australia I'm in Queensland yeah are you so in from okay. from the UK originally but we moved to Sydney I hated it and then we moved to Western Australia and Western wow. Australia is is like I imagine New Zealand in in the sensibility it's a big country town it's just very chilled and relaxed and 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 that's what I and that's why I love Queensland too because Queenslanders do not do anything fast <laughs> <laughs> oh that is so funny yeah wow wonderful well, well and, and you haven't been to New Zealand yet no I need to come over because one of my best friends from when I was growing up she actually lives in Hamilton and I'm desperate to to go over and see her and I haven't done it yet and I want to go and see Hobbiton too and I want to do some skiing in Queenstown <laughs> oh, good. Well, let me know let me know oh, are you down on South Island yep no, Why so- South? that's a lot different to California it's not even remotely warm on South Island like not remotely if you saw, if you saw how many layers I have on right now oh right <laughs> <laughs> uh you know I, I think the thing that really um really has spoken to me in New Zealand is is the land. The land is so powerful and beautiful. And I grew up in big cities of so Los Angeles, lived for many years in New York City and uh, in the San Francisco area. And uh, that just didn't, the city living just wasn't so much inspiring to me anymore. I mean, it's fun, but uh, it just feels like this, at this moment in my life, I'm I'm much happier having access to the natural world because it's it's the nature that like feeds me and supports me and yeah that's just where I resource myself is from the from the beauty of of the land and I imagine it's probably something similar where you are up in Queensland it's very beautiful. I can't do cities. I find I, I get very anxious in cities I never have I grew up in the countryside I don't mind going visiting a city but even though we live on the Gold Coast which everybody thinks of the high rises in surfers we live 
only about a 20 minute drive from the coast, but we're in the country. We're right. on or well, semi rural. It's not a fully rural area, but it's mm. semi rural. And mm. that's fine because I've got access to the city, to all the, the resources in the city, but I don't have to live there and I can hear all the birds and it's that's right. peaceful. And I've got the space. The energy is dissipated. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Yep. I, it I, was I, interesting actually going on that when my kids were young. They went to this school in Western Australia and the school was on 200 hectares. So massive tracts wow. of land. And I was talking to the principal of the junior school and I said, it, it just feels really calm. The, the prep school doesn't feel like a school for <laughs> little kids and all their screaming. He said, it's because of the space. The energy just dissipates and it actually calms the children down. Mm. And I hadn't thought of that before, but it's probably absolutely spot on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just, just having that sort of energetic breathing room, and yeah, that sounds tremendous. Did yeah, they, they use all of the land? Did they? Did they go like on hikes and things like that around the land? Oh uh, well, <laughs> it was so the school had one and a half kilometers of Swan River frontage, so the river was on one side so they used to do all the they had horses on the land that wow. used to escape fairly regularly which was a bit of a nuisance because we'd have to gather all the kids in because the horses were running in this big herd across the property but they also had uh, a property about 20 kilometers away uh, up in the hills outside of perth and that was several thousand hectares and they used to go on camps and things up to that property so yeah wealthy school very very lucky to to have all the facilities that it did in terms of the space and everything yeah mm, sounds fabulous no it was great it was great have you thought of that archetype other than have, the crow oh you know what i thought of wonder woman <laughs> <laughs> you know like she can do anything and she's like I'm going to wear this cute little outfit and I'm going to go with my golden lasso and, you know, was it the lasso of truth? But yeah, I don't know why. That's that's what came to me is that um, that yes. strength. Power yeah. Of, yeah. I mean, it, now now that you're thinking about archetypes, you, you will see you will see it everywhere. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see what what you come up with next is. Yeah, and and the people who are listening, like that would be a really interesting exercise to do. When you've listened to this, can you comment in on the posts and just let me and Elizabeth know what yeah. archetypes came up for you and what archetypes you are um, attracted to, you connect with? Would be really interesting. Absolutely. I'd love to know that. Because yeah. everyone, you know, everyone will have their own and you might meet a part of yourself. You may be like, oh, wow, I wonder why I keep thinking about this particular thing. And it's an exploration because ultimately that's what we're doing is we're, we're uncovering and being reminded of, of this, these vast energies inside of us so that we can feel like we're fully alive. Can we as women have a male archetype? Oh yes, of course, absolutely. There's no, there's, there's no delineation, and and of course, men can have female archetypes. I think it would probably be good if there was if there was more of that um, crossover. The the thing that I that I say though about women is because uh, we've maybe been a little more resistant to exploring a wider range of who we are. That that it may be more um, more comfortable or easier to explore the other feminine archetypes uh, before incorporating male ones as well. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe some people are just like, nope, I want to go straight to Zeus. That's, that's my thing. So there's no rules. We're all just making this up as we go along. It's oh now I've got an image in my mind. Uh, I was reading an article the other day about Natalie Portman apparently plays Thor in the next movie. Oh, Taika Waititi. Yes. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, yes. and she had to really bulk up for the thing. That, that was what the point of the article was. But now we're talking, I'm thinking, oh, okay, female version of Thor, because although Thor's masculine, he's actually got very sensitive kind of attributes to him. Mm. Mm. Wow. That sounds really good. I mean, because the truth is we have we have we have what is considered masculine, what is considered feminine all in us. And um, it's all good. Yeah, it's fa- it's really good. Now, just before we go, because I'm just looking at the time again. OK, we're going way over oh, here wow. <laughs> because we're enjoying ourselves, which is great. Yes. But before we sign off, just tell people where they can get in touch with you. Obviously, there will be links and everything on the web page that goes with this podcast. But just let people know how they can contact you and buy the book and do everything. The best way to reach me is via my website, which is elizabethagouldstories.com. So that's E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H-A-G-O-U-L-D.com. And, and there you can sign up for my email list of which I you know send out monthly newsletters and um, I have some blog posts just starting up on there. The most recent one is about menopause and then it has different places you can buy the books, but it's available from all major retailers. So you know I'd love to hear what people what people think about it. And, I think uh, it's a great idea. It was yeah, I think it's a, a really good tool to help us become who we want to be. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I think I made another friend here. This is great. Yay, yay. (laughs) You better call me when you're in town. I will. I will. (laughs) Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends, please. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great ideas that can make a difference in your everyday life. Until next time.